Good evening. My name is Stephen Deininger. I'm the founder and executive director of Pandemic Players. I would like to thank everyone for joining us for J.M. Barry's Dear Brutus. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, our entire operation to include tonight's performance is conducted from completely quarantined conditions. All rehearsals and all the work done behind the scenes to present tonight's play were conducted with no face-to-face -face interactions. We do not record our actors beforehand. Everything that you see tonight is live. The danger that anything can go wrong at any time is, if anything, amplified. The actors are performing from what are probably the worst conditions they could perform from. If you would like to volunteer to help us, please request to join the Facebook Pandemic Players Planning Group. We solicit auditions and request volunteer help within that forum. While the general public are invited to attend our virtual performances free of charge, donations are accepted to aid the theaters in the greater Baltimore area that have suffered economic impact from this current situation. Pandemic Players is completely self-funded. We supply our own equipment and fund our own server spaces. Instead, we ask that our audience, if they're able to, donate to a local theater that needs help to still be there when normalcy returns to the world. Each week, our volunteers nominate and vote on a theater to support with our new production. Tonight, we are raising money to support our friends at the Strand Theater Company. This is a company that I was personally unfamiliar with somehow, but after hearing their mission to present only plays by female playwrights to shine a light on and celebrate their work, I can't wait to be the first patron when they're able to resume operations. While you are free to view tonight's performance, we ask that a donation be made if possible. We recommend $20, which is the average cost of a ticket to a locally produced theater production. And we thank you for anything that you are willing to give. To make donations easy, you can find a donation link on our public Facebook page, Pandemic Players. We'll also have web links in the comments of the YouTube stream to help you find out where to go. The Board of Pandemic Players extends a very heartfelt thank you to all of tonight's performers, volunteers, donors, and supporters for choosing to take part in this effort. Your actions and your help bring hope to our community. Tonight, everything may not go perfect. If everything were perfect, we would all be on stage and we would not have to take extraordinary measures to make sure that this Saturday evening live theater would still be happening. Tonight, we bring you a story of magic, a story of lovers and miscreants, and most of all, a story for all the might have beens. Pandemic Players is proud to present Dear Brutus. darkened room. The room is so obscure as to be invisible, but at the back of the obscurity are French windows, through which is seen a garden bathed in moonshine. The moonshine stealing about among the flowers, to give them the last of their instructions, has left a smile upon them, but it is a smile with a menace in it for the dwellers in darkness. What we expect to see is the moonshine slowly pushing the windows open so that it may whisper to a confederate in the house whose name is Lob. But though we may be sure that this was about to happen, it does not happen. A stir among the dwellers in darkness prevents it. These unsuspecting ones are in the dining room, and as a communicating door opens, we hear them at play. Several tenebrous shades appear in the lighted doorway and hesitate on the two steps that lead down into the unlit room. The fanciful among us may conceive a rustle at the same moment among the flowers. The engagement has begun, though not in the way we had intended. Good 
Come on, Cody, lead the way. Oh dear, I don't see why I should go first. The nicest always goes first. Oh, it is a strange house if I am the nicest. It is a strange house. Don't close the door. I can't see where the switch is. Oh, it's over here. They have been groping their way forward, blissfully unaware of how they shall be groping there again more terribly before the night is out. Someone finds a switch and the room is illumined, with the effect that the garden seems to have drawn back a step as if worsted in the first encounter. But it is only waiting. There are five ladies, and one only of them is elderly, the Mrs. Code, whom a voice in the darkness has already proclaimed the nicest. She is the nicest, though the vice was no good judge. If she lives to be a hundred, she will pretend to the census man that she is only ninety-nine. Of the other four ladies, all young and physically fair, two are married, Mrs. Durth and Mrs. Purdy. There remains Lady Caroline Laney of the disdainful poise, lately from the enormously select school where they are taught to pronounce their R's as W's. Nothing else seems to be taught. Are these ladies then so very alike? They would all deny it. So we must take our own soundings. At this moment of their appearance in the drawing room, at least they are alike in having a common interest. No sooner has the dining room door closed than purpose leaps to their eyes. Oddly enough, the men having been got rid of, the drama begins. We must not waste a second. Our minds are made up, I think. Now is the time. Yes, now, if at all, but should we? Oh, certainly, and before the men come in. You don't think we should wait for the men? They are as much in as we are. Lark would be with them. If the thing is to be done at all, it should be done now. Is it quite fair to Lob? After all, he is our host. Of course it isn't fair to him, but, but let's do it, Cody. Oh, yes, let's do it. Mrs. Durth is doing it. Oh, of course I am. The men are not coming, are they? No. Your husband is having another glass of port. I am sure he is. Uh, one of you, ring, please. Oh, poor matey. No, oh, he witchly deserves what he is about to get. He's coming. Don't all stand huddled together like conspirators. Well, it is what we are. Ah, matey, I wish this telegram sent. Very good, ma'am. The village post office closed at eight, but if your message is important... It is, and you are so clever, matey. I am sure that you can persuade them to oblige you. I will see to it myself, ma'am. You can depend on its going. Thank you. Better read the telegram, matey. To be sure that you can make it out. Read it oh. aloud, matey. Oh, oh ma'am. Aloud. <sighs> to police station, Great Cumney. Send officer first thing tomorrow morning to arrest matey butler for theft of rings. Yes, that is quite right. Ma'am, my lady. Should we not say how many rings? Oh, yes. Uh, put in the number of rings, matey. May I tear up the telegram, ma'am? No, oh, certainly not. I always said this man was the culprit. I am never mistaken in faces, and I see broad arrows all over yours, matey. It is deeply regretted. I am sure it is. We may as well tell him now that it is not our rings we are worrying about. They have just been a means to an end, matey. Precisely. In other words, that telegram is sent unless... Unless you can tell us instantly what peculiarity it is that all we ladies have in common. Not only the ladies, all the guests of this house. We have been here a week. And we find that when Lob invited us, he knew us all so little that we begin to wonder why he asked us. And now, from words he has let drop, we know that we were invited because of something he thinks we have in common. But he won't say what it is. 
And one knows that no people could be more unalike. One does. And we can't sleep at night, matey, for wondering what the something is. But we are sure you know, and if you don't tell us, what? I don't know what you mean, ladies. Oh, yes, you do. You must admit that your master is a very strange person. He is a little odd, ma'am. That is why everyone calls him Lob, and not Mr. Lob. He is so odd that it has got on my nerves that we have been invited here for some sort of horrid experiment. You look as if you thought so too. Oh, no, miss. I, I, uh, he... You shouldn't have come, ladies. You didn't ought to have come. No, my man. What do you mean by that? Uh, nothing, my lady. I, I just mean, why did you come if you were all the kind that he thinks? The kind he thinks? What kind does he think? Now we are getting at it. I haven't a notion, ma'am. Then it is not necessarily our virtue that makes Lob interested in us. In the moonlight, roses, mm. roses, all the way. It is like a hat I had once when I was young. Lob is such an amazing gardener that I believe he could even grow hats. He is a wonderful gardener, but is that quite nice at his age? What is his age, man? He won't tell, my lady. I think he is frightened that the police would step in if they knew how old he was. They do say in the village that they remember him 70 years ago, looking just as he does today. Oh, absurd. Yes, ma'am, but there are his razors. Razors? Oh, you won't know about razors, my lady, not being married as yet, excuse me, but a married lady can tell a man's age by the number of his razors. If you saw his razors, there, there's a little world of them, from patents of the present day back to implements so horrible, you can picture him with them in his hand, scraping away through the ages. You amuse one to an extent. Was he ever married? He has quite forgotten, my lady. How long ago is it since Merry England? Why do you ask? In Queen Elizabeth's time, wasn't it? He says he is all that is left of Merry England, that little man. Lob? I think there is a famous cricketer called Lob. Wasn't there a Lob in Shakespeare? Oh, no, of course. I am thinking of Rob, Robin Goodfellow. Oh, yes, the names are so alike. Robin Goodfellow was Puck. That's what was in my head. Lob was another name for Puck. Well, he is certainly rather like what Puck might have grown into if he had forgotten to die. And by the way, I remember now, he does call his flowers by the old Elizabethan names. He always calls the nightingale Philomel, miss, if that is any help. None, whatever. Tell me this. Did he specifically ask you all for Midsummer Week? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. He would. Now, what do you mean? He always likes them to be here on Midsummer Night, ma'am. Them? But whom? Them who have that in common. What can it be? I don't know. I hope we are all nice women. We don't know each other very well. Does anything startling happen at those times? I don't know. Why, I believe this is Midsummer Eve. Yes, miss, it is. The villagers know it. They are all inside the houses tonight with the doors barred. Beca because of him? He frightens them. There are stories. What alarms them? Uh, tell us, or... Uh... Uh, well, I know nothing for certain, ma'am. I've never done it myself. He has wanted me to, but I wouldn't. Done what? Oh, ma'am, don't ask me. Be merciful to me. I am not bad naturally. It was just going into domestic service that did that for me. The accident of being flung among bad companions. It's touch and go how the poor turn out in this world. All depends on your taking the right or the wrong turning. Oh, I dare say that is true. When I was a young man, ma'am, I was offered a clerkship in the city. If I had taken it, there wouldn't be a more honest man alive today. I would give the world to begin over again. 
It is very sad, Mrs. Durth. I am sorry for him, but still. What do you say, my lady? As you ask me, I should certainly say jail. If you will say no more about this, ma'am, I'll give you a tip that is worth it. Ah, now you're a-talking. Don't listen to him. You are the one that is hardest on me. Yes, I flatter myself I am. You might make a wrong turn yourself, milady. How dare you, man? The men are rising. Oh, very well. Matey, we agree. If the tip is good enough... You will regret this. I think not, milady. It's this. I wouldn't go out tonight if he asks you. Go into the garden if you like. The garden is all right. I wouldn't go no farther tonight. Not tonight. But he never proposes to us to go farther. Why should he tonight? I don't know, ma'am, but don't go any of you. Except you, my lady. I should like you to go. Oh. Fellow! Uh, shall I? Uh, thank you, ma'am. You should have sent that telegram off. You are sure you have told us all you know, matey? Yes, miss. Above all, ladies, I wouldn't go into the wood. The wood? Why, there is no wood within a dozen miles of here. No, ma'am, but all the same, I wouldn't go into it, ladies. Not if I was you. Standing, dear lady, pray oh, be seated. You naughty. It is quite a flirtation, isn't it? Well, is my husband still sampling the port, Mr. Purdy? Oh, do you know? I believe he is. Uh, do the ladies like our proposal code? Well, I, I have not told them it yet. Uh, the fact is, I'm afraid it might tire my wife too much. Uh, do you feel equal to a little exertion tonight, Cody, or, or is your foot troubling you? I have been resting it, Code. Well, presently, dear. If you are agreeable, we are all going out for a walk. Oh, the garden is all right. Ah, but it is not the garden. We are going farther afield. We have an adventure for tonight. Get thick shoes and a wrap, Mrs. Durf, all of you. Where do you propose to take us? Oh, to find a mysterious wood. Are you being funny, Mr. Purdy? <laughs> You know quite well that there are not any trees for miles around. You've said yourself that is the one blot on the landscape. Ah, on ordinary occasions, but allow us to point out to you, Miss Joanna, that this is Midsummer Eve. Uh, tell them what you told us, Lob. <laughs> it is all nonsense, of course. <laughs> Just foolish talk of the villagers. They say that on Midsummer Eve there's a strange wood in this part of the country. Where? Ah, that is one of the most charming features. It is never twice in the same place, apparently. It has been seen on different parts of the Downs and on Moor Common. Once it was close to Radley Village, and another time about a mile from the sea. Oh, a sporting wood. And Lob is anxious that we should all go and look for it. Mm, not he. Lob is the only skeptic in the house. Says it is all rubbish and that we should be sillies if we go. <laughs> but we believe, eh, Purdy? Rather. Just wasting the evening. Let us have a round game of cards here instead. No, sir, I am going to find that wood. What is the good of it when it is found? We shall wander in it deliciously, listening to a new sort of bird called the Philomel. Shall we keep together, Mr. Purdy? No, uh, we must hunt in pairs. Well, I, I think it would be rather fun. Come on, Cody, I'll lace your boots for you. I'm sure your poor foot will carry you nicely. Uh, Miss Trout, wait a moment. Lob, has this wonderful wood any special properties? Pooh, there's no wood. You've never seen it. Not I. I don't believe in it. Well, have any of the villagers ever been in it? So it's said. So it's said. Well, what did they say were their experiences? Uh, that isn't known. They never came back. Never came back? Absurd, of course. You see, in the morning, the wood was gone, and so they were gone, too. <laughs> oh, I don't think I like this wood. It certainly is Midsummer Eve. Of course, if you ladies are against it, we will drop the idea. It was only a bit of fun. Yes, better give it up. 
to please Lob. Oh, all right, Lob. What about that round game of cards? I wanted you to go. I had set my heart on you going. It is the thing I wanted. It isn't good for me not to get the thing I want. Gracious. He wanted it all along, you wicked lob. Now you see there is something in it. No nonsense, Mrs. Darth. It was only a joke. Don't cry, Lobby. Nobody loves me. Nobody loves me and I, I need to be loved. Oh, yes, we do. We all love you. Nice, nice, Lobby. Dear Lob, I'm so fond of you. Dry his eyes with my own handkerchief. Don't pamper him. What? I need to be pampered. Oh, you funny little man. Let us all go at once and go look for the wood. Boots and cloaks, hats forward. Come on, Lady Caroline, just to show you are not afraid of matey. <laughs> Poor bruised one, it was I who hurt you. Lob is so sorry, lie there. Pretty, pretty. Let me see where you have a pain. You fell on your head, is this the place? Now I make it better. Oh, little rascal, you're not hurt at all. You just pretend, oh dear, oh dear. Oh, sweetheart, don't cry. You are now prettier than ever. You were too tall. Oh, how beautifully you smell now that you are small. Drink, drink, now you're happy yet again. The little rascal smiles, all smile, please. Nod heads, <laughs> you love Lob and Lob loves you. What are you saying to them, Lob? Nothing, nothing. I was saying a two's company, a three's none. <laughs> that man, he suspects. Oh, no one minds Lob, my dear. Oh, my dear. Yes, but he saw you kiss my hand. Jack, if Mabel were to suspect... Uh, there is nothing for her to suspect. No, there isn't, is there? Jack, I'm not doing anything wrong, am I? You? Mabel is your wife, Jack. I should so hate myself if I did anything that was disloyal to her. Oh, those eyes could never be disloyal. My lady of the nut-brown eyes. Oh, the sveltness of you, Joanna. You are so svelte. All I want is to help her and you. I know uh, how well I know, my dear, brave love. I'm very fond of Mabel, Jack. I should like to be the best friend she has in the world. You are, dearest. No woman ever had a better friend. And yet, I don't think she really likes me. I wonder why. It's just that Mabel doesn't understand. Nothing could make me say a word against my wife. I wouldn't listen to you if you did. Oh, and I love you all the more, dear, for saying that. But Mabel is a cold nature, and, and she doesn't understand. She doesn't appreciate your finer qualities. Oh, that's it. But of course I am difficult. I was always a strange, strange creature. I often think, Johanna, that I am rather like a flower that has never had the sun to shine on it, nor the rain to water it. You break my heart. I suppose there is no more lonely man walking the earth than I today. It is so mournful. It is the thought of you that sustains me, elevates me. You shine high above me like a star. No, no, I wish I was wonderful, but I'm not. You've made me a better man, Joanna. I am so proud to think that. You have made me kinder to Mabel. I'm sure you were always kind to her. Yes, I hope so. Uh, but I think now of special little ways of giving her pleasure, that never-to-be-forgotten day when we first met, you and I. That tragic, lovely day by the weir. Oh, Jack. Do you know how in gratitude I spent the rest of the day? Tell me. I read to Mabel aloud for an hour. I did it to kindness to her, but it's because I had met you. It was dear of you. Do you remember that first time in my arms? Your waist... You are so fluid, Joanna. Why are you so fluid? I can't help it, Jack. I gave her a ruby bracelet for that. It is a gem. You have given that lucky woman many lovely things. It is my invariable custom to go straight off and buy Mabel something whenever you have been sympathetic to me. Those new earrings of hers, 
They are in memory of the first day you called me Jack. Her Paquin gown, the one with the beads, was because you let me kiss you. I didn't exactly let you. No, but you have such a dear way of giving in. Jack, she hasn't worn that gown of late. Uh, no, nor the jewels. I think she has some sort of idea now that when I give her anything nice, it means that you have been nice to me. She has rather a suspicious nature, Mabel. She never used to have it, but it seems to be growing on her. I wonder why. I wonder why. Was that anyone in the garden? Well, there is no one there now. I'm sure I heard someone. If it was Mabel. Jack, if she saw us, she will think you were kissing me. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, Jack. But please, wait a moment before you kiss her again. Excuse me, Joanna. I didn't want the others to see you. They might not understand how noble you are, Jack. You can go on now. How extraordinary. Of all the... Oh, but how contemptible. Mabel. Did you call me, Joanna? I insist on an explanation. What were you doing in the garden, Mabel? Why, I was looking for something I've lost. Oh, anything important? I used to fancy it, Jack. It is my husband's love. You haven't happened to pick it up, Joanna, have you? If so, and you don't set any great store by it, I should like it back. The pieces, I mean. Mabel, I, I will not be talked to in that way. To imply that I, that your husband, oh, shame. I must say, Mabel, that I am a little disappointed in you. I certainly understood that you had gone upstairs to put on your boots. Poor old Jack. A woman like that. I forgive you, Mabel. You will be sorry for this afterwards. Not a word against Joanna, Mabel. If you knew how nobly she has spoken of you. She does know. She's been listening. If you wish it, I shall always be true to you in word and deed. It is your right. But I cannot pretend that Joanna is not the one woman in the world for me. If I had met her before you, it's, it's kismet, I suppose. Too late. Too late. I suppose you never knew what true love was till you met her, Jack. Well, you forced me to say it. Johanna and I are one as a person. We have not a thought at variance. We are one rather than two. Yes, and that's the one. I'm so sorry to have marred your lives. If any blame there is, it is all mine. She is as spotless as the driven snow. The moment I'd mentioned love to her, she told me to desist. Not she. So you were listening. Mabel, don't you see how splendid he is? Not quite, Joanna. How lovely of you, Jack, to take it all upon yourself. It is the man's privilege. Mabel has such a horrid way of seeming to put people in the wrong. Have you noticed that? Poor Mabel. It's not an enviable quality. I don't think I care to go out now. She has spoilt it all. She has taken the innocence out of it, Jack. Oh, we must be brave and not mind her. Joanna, if we had met in time, if only I could begin again, oh, to be battered forever just because I took one wrong turn, it isn't fair. The wrong turning. Now, who was saying that a moment ago about himself? Why, why it was Matey. Is that her coming back again? It's too bad. Ah, it's uh, you, Mrs. Death. <laughs> ah, yes, it is. But thank you for telling me, Mr. Purdy. I don't intrude, do I? Why should you? Rather not. We were hoping it would be you. Uh, we want to start on the walk. I can't think of what has become of the others. We have been looking for them everywhere. Well, do go on looking. Under that flower pot would be a good place. It is my husband I am in search of. Shall I route him out for you? Oh, how too unutterably kind of you, Mr. Purdy. Well, I hate to trouble you, but it would be the sort of service one never forgets. You know, I believe you are chafing me. Oh, no, no. I am incapable of that. I won't be a moment. Miss Trout and I will await your return with ill-concealed impatience. Yes, I suppose you are right. I dare say I am. I didn't say anything. 
Well, I thought I heard you say that hateful dearth woman coming butting in when she is not wanted. You certainly have good ears. Yes, uh, they have always been uh, rather admired. By the painters for whom you sat when you were an artist's model. So that's leaked out, has it? I shouldn't have said that. Do you think I care whether you know or not? I'm sure you don't. Still, it, it was cattish of me. It was. I don't see it. <laughs> I am uncommonly flattered, Alice, to hear that you have sent for me. It quite takes me aback. It isn't your company I want, Will. You know, I felt that Purdy must have delivered your message wrongly. I want you to come with us on this mysterious walk and keep an eye on Lob. On poor little Lob? Oh, surely not. Well, I can't make that man out. I want you to tell me something. When he invited us here, do you think it was you or me he specially wanted? Oh, you. He made no bones about it. Said there was something about you that made him want uncommonly to have you down here. Will, try to remember this. Did he ask us for any particular time? Oh, yes, he was particular about its being a uh, midsummer week. Oh, I thought so. Did he say what it was about me that made him want to have me here in midsummer week? No, but I presumed it must be your fascination, Alice. Oh, just so. Well, I want you to come out with us tonight to watch him. Crack in my eye, Tommy. Spy on my host. And such a harmless little chap, too. Excuse me, Alice. Besides, I have an engagement. Oh, an engagement. With the port decanter, I presume. Ah, good guess. But wrong. The decanter is now but an empty shell. Still, how you know me. My engagement is with a quiet cigar in the garden. Your hand is so unsteady. You won't be able to light the match. I'll just manage. A nice hand for an artist. Oh, one would scarcely call me an artist nowadays. But not so far as any work is concerned. Oh, not so far as having any more pretty dreams to paint is concerned. Hmm. Wonder why I have become such a waster, Alice. Oh, I suppose it was always in you. I suppose so. And yet, I was rather a good sort in the days when I went courting you. Yes, I thought so. Unlucky days for me, as it has turned out. Oh, yes. A bad job for you. I didn't know I was a wrong un at the time thought quite well of myself, thought a vast deal more of you. Crack in my eye, Tommy, how I used to leap out of bed at 6 a.m., all agog to be at my easel. Blood ran through my veins in those days. And now I'm middle-aged and done for. Funny, don't know how it has come about, nor what has made the music mute. Ah, when did you begin to despise me, Alice? When I got to know you, really. Will, a long time ago. Yes, I think that is true. It was a long time ago. And before I had begun to despise myself. It wasn't till I knew you had no opinion of me that I began to go downhill. You will grant me that, won't you? and that I did try for a bit to fight on. If you had cared for me, I wouldn't have come to this, surely? Well, I found out I didn't care for you, and I wasn't hypocrite enough to pretend I did. That's blunt, but you used to admire me for my bluntness. <laughs> the bluntness of you. The adorable wildness of you. You, you untamed thing. There were never any shades in you, 
kiss or kill was your motto, Alice. I felt from the first moment I saw you that you would love me or knife me. But I didn't knife you. No, I suppose that was where you made the mistake. It is hard on you, old lady. I suppose it's too late to try to patch things up? Let's be honest. It is too late, Will. Oh, perhaps if we had had children. Pity. Well, a blessing, I should think, seeing what sort of a father they would have had. I dare say you're right. Well, Alice, I know that somehow it's my fault. I'm sorry for you. I'm sorry for myself. If I hadn't married you, what a different woman I should be. What a fool I was. Ah. Uh. Three things they say come not back to men nor women. The spoken word, the past life, and the neglected opportunity. Wonder if we should make any more of them, Alice, if they did come back to us. Well, you wouldn't. I, I guess you're right. But I, yes, I would. Yes, what a boon for you. But I hope it's not Freddie Finch Fallow you would put in my place. I, I know he is following you about again. Well, he followed me about, as you put it, before I knew you. I don't know why I quarreled with him. Your heart told you that he was no good, Alice. Oh, my heart told me that you were. So it wasn't of much service to me, my heart. The Honorable Freddie Finch Fellow is a rotter. Well, you are certainly an authority on the subject. You have me there. After which brief but pleasant little canubial chat, he pursued his dishonored way into the garden. Oh. Here they are. Are you ready, dear lady? Are you not coming with us to find the wood, Mr. Darth? Alas, I am unavoidably detained. You will find me in the garden when you come back. If we ever do come back. Precisely. Should we never meet again, Alice? Fare thee well. Purdy, if you find the tree of knowledge in the wood, bring me back an apple. I promise. Come quickly. Matey mustn't see me. Matey? What difference would that make, Lob? He would take me off to bed, tis past my time. You know, old fellow, you, you make it very difficult for us to embark upon this adventure in the proper eerie spirit. <laughs> well, I'm for the garden. How now, Duff? Was, what is it we get in that wood, Lob? Ah, uh, he won't tell us that. Come on. Tell us first. They say that in the wood you get what nearly everybody here is longing for. A second chance. So that is what we have in common. I have often thought, Cody, that if I had had a second chance I should be a, a, a useful man instead of just a nice lazy one. A second chance. Come on. Yes, to the wood, to the wood. Oh, stop. Why not go this way? He pulls the curtains apart, and there comes a sudden indrawing of breath from all, for no garden is there now. In its place is an endless wood of great trees. The nearest of them has come close to the window. It is a somber wood with splashes of moonshine and blackness standing very still in it. Anyone ready to risk it? Of course there is nothing in it, just... Of course. Going out, Purdy? A second chance. I shall be back in a moment. Probably. As Mr. Durth passes into the wood, his hands rise as if a hammer has tapped him on the forehead. He is soon lost to view. Well, he does not come back. 
It's horrible. Mrs. Code steals off by the door to her room, calling to her husband to do likewise. Come on, Cody. He takes a step after her and stops in the grip of the two words that holds them all. The stillness continues. At last, Mrs. Purdy goes out into the wood, her hands raised, and is swallowed up by it. Mabel! You will have to go now, Mr. Purdy. Mr. Purdy looks at Joanna, and they go out together, one tap of the hammer for each. That's enough. Don't you go, Mrs. Death. You'll catch it if you go. Second chance. Alice goes out unflinching. One would like to know. Lady Caroline goes out. Cody. Mm. Mrs. Code's voice is heard from the stair calling to her husband. He hesitates but follows Lady Caroline. To Lob now alone comes Matey with a tray of coffee cups. It is past your bedtime, sir. Say goodnight to the ladies and come along. Matey, look. Great heavens, then it's true. Yes, but I I wasn't sure. Matey approaches the window cautiously to peer out, and his master gives him a sudden push that propels <laughs> him into the wood. He lobs back is toward us as he stands alone, staring out upon the unknown. He is terrified still, yet quivers of rapture are running up and down his little frame. Some other glade a nightingale is singing in this one, in proud motoring attire, recline two mortals whom we have known in different conditions. This second chance has converted them into husband and wife. The man of gross, muddy build lies luxurious on his back exuding affluence, a prominent part of him heaving playfully, like some little wave that will not rest in a still sea. It is not a lovely night, Jim. Listen, my own to Philomel. He's saying that he is lately married. And so are you, you ducky thing. I feel, Jim, that I am Rosalind and you are my Orlando. What do you say I am, Caroline? My own one. Don't you think it would be fun if we were to write poems about each other and post them on the tree trunks? Poems? I never knew such a lass for high-flown language. Your lass, Jim's lass. And don't you forget it. Listen, <laughs> Caroline, that is what gets the ladies. Ooh, how much have you made this week, you wonderful man? Another 200 or so. That's all, just 200 or so. My dear golden fetter, listen to him. Kiss my fetter, Jim. Wait till I light this cigar. Let me hold the darling match. Tidy little, looking little petite corona this. There was a time when one of that sort would have run away with two days of my screw. How I should have loved Jim to know you when you were poor. Fancy your once having been a clerk. Uh, we all have our beginnings, but it wouldn't have mattered how I began, Caroline. I should have come to the top just the same. I am a climber, and there are nails in my boots for parties beneath me. Boots. I tell you, if I had been a bootmaker, I should have been the first bootmaker in London. I am sure you would, Jim. But should you have made the best boots? Very good, Caroline. That is the nearest thing I've heard you say. But it's late. Mm. We'd best be strolling back to our Rolls Royce. 
<laughs> I do hope the ground wasn't damp. Don't matter if it was. I was lying on your rug. <laughs> Who is the mournful party? I wonder, sir, whether you happen to have seen my husband? I've lost him in the wood. We are strangers in these parts ourselves, missus. Have we passed anyone, Caroline? Should we have noticed, dear? Might it be that old gent over there? Oh, no. My husband is quite young. <laughs> Seems a merry old cock. Evening to you, sir. Do you happen to have seen a young gentleman in the wood lately, all by himself and looking for his wife? Can't say that I have. He isn't necessarily by himself, and I don't know that he's looking for me. There may be a young lady with him. <laughs> what do you mean by that? <clears throat> oh, if you like that better. Now, 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 your mar manners, Caroline. Oh, no, no. W would he be singing or dancing? Oh, no. I... At least I hope not. Hope not. Odd. Well, if he is doing neither, I am not likely to notice him, but uh, if I do, what name shall I say? Purdy. I am Mrs. Purdy. <sighs> I will try to keep a lookout, and if I see him, uh, but, but I am rather occupied at the present. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to have troubled you. I, I see him now. Is he alone? Oh. I see from your face that he isn't. Caroline, no awkward questions. Evening, Mrs., and I hope you will get to him, get him to go along with you quietly. Watch the old cotter dancing. No, and no, and no. I don't know. You are nearly enough for that. Besides, what would your wife say? I shall begin to think that you are a very dreadful man, Mr. Purdy. Surely you might call me Jack by this time. Perhaps, if you are very good, Jack. If only Johanna were more like you. Like me? You mean her face? It is a, well, it is not precisely pretty, is it? It is a good face. I don't mind her face at all. I'm glad you've got such a dependable little wife, Jack. Thanks. What would Joanna have said if she had seen you just now? A wife should be incapable of jealousy. Joanna jealous? <laughs> but has she any reason? Jack, tell me, who is the woman? Shall I, Mabel? Shall I? I can't think who she is. Have I ever seen her? Every time you look in the mirror. How odd, Jack. That can't be. When I look in a mirror, I see only myself. Oh, how adorably innocent you are, Mabel. Joanna would have guessed at once. Not that. Shall I tell you now? I don't know. I'm not sure. Jack, try not to say it, but if you feel you must, say it in such a way that it would not hurt the feelings of Joanna if she happen to be passing by, as she nearly always is. I would rather not say it at all than, than that way. I don't know, Mabel, whether you have noticed that I am not like other men. All my life I have been a soul that has had to walk alone. Even as a child, I had no hope that it would be otherwise. I distinctly remember when I was six thinking how unlike other children I was. Before I was 12, I suffered from terrible self-deprecation. I do so still. I suppose there never was a man who had more lowly opinion of himself. Jack, you who are so universally admired. Oh, that doesn't help. I remain my own judge. I'm afraid I am a dark spirit, Mabel. Yes, yes, my dear. Let me leave nothing untold, however it may damage me in your eyes. Oh, your eyes. I cannot remember a time when I did not think of love as a great consuming passion. I visualized it, Mabel, as perhaps few have done, but always as the abounding joy that could come to others, but never to me. I expected too much of women. I supposed I was touched to finer issues than most. That has been my tragedy. And then you met Joanna. And then I met Joanna. 
Yes, foolishly as I now see, I, I thought she would understand that I was far too deep a nature really to mean the little things I sometimes say to her. I suppose a man was never placed in such a position before. What was I to do? Remember, I was always certain that the ideal love could never come to me. Whatever the circumstances, I was convinced that my soul must walk alone. Joanna, how could you? Oh, not a word against her, Mabel. If blame there is, the blame is mine. And so you married her? And so I married her. Out of pity? I felt it was a man's part. I, I was such a child in worldly matters that it was pleasant to me to have the right to pay a woman's bills. I enjoyed seeing her garments lying about on my chairs. And in time, that exultation wore off. But I was not unhappy. I didn't expect much. I, I was always so sure that no woman could ever plumb the well of my emotions. And then you met me. And then I met you. Too late. Never, forever, forever, never. Those are the saddest words in the English tongue. At the time, I thought a still sadder word was Joanna. What was it you saw in me that made you love me? I think it was the feeling that you are so like myself. Have you noticed that, Jack? Sometimes it almost terrified me. We think the same thoughts. We are not two, Mabel. We are one. Your hair. Joanna knows you admire it. And for a week she did hers in exactly the same way. I never noticed. That was why she gave it up. And it didn't really suit her. I can't think of a good way of doing Joanna's hair. What is that you're muttering to yourself, Jack? Don't keep anything from me. I was repeating a poem that I have written. It is in two words. Mabel Purdy. May I teach it to you, sweet? Say Mabel Purdy to me. If I were to say it, Jack, I should be false to Joanna. Never ask me to be that. Let us go on. Say it, Mabel. Say it. See, I write it on the ground with your sunshade. If it could be, Jack. Jack, I'll whisper it to you. We see two figures, a father and a daughter. The father is our old friend, Mr. Durth. The strange daughter is a stranger to us. They are racing, the prize to be for the one who first finds the spot where the easel was put up last. The hobble de hoy is sure to be the winner, for she is less laden and the father loses time by singing as he comes. Also, she is all legs, and she started the head. Brambles adhere to her. One boot has been in the water, and she has many freckles as there are stars in heaven. She is as lovely as you think she is, and she is aged to the moment when you like your daughter best. A hoot of triumph from her brings her father to the spot. Daddy! Daddy, I have won! Here is the place crack in my eye, Tommy! Yes, that is the tree I stuck my easel under last night, and behold the blessed moon behaving more gorgeously than ever. I am sorry to have kept you waiting, old moon, but you ought to know by now how time passes. Now, keep still while I hand you down to posterity. The moon is rather pale tonight, isn't she? Comes of keeping late hours. Daddy, watch me. Look at me. Please, sweet moon, a pleasant expression. No, no, not as if you were sitting on it. That is too professional. That is better, thank you. Now keep it. That is the sort of thing you say to them, Dad. I oughtn't to have brought you out so late. You should be tucked up in your cozy bed at home. With the pillow, anyhow. Except in its proper place. And the sheet over my face. Oh, where it oughtn't to be. Daddy tiptoeing in to take it off. Which is more than you deserve. Then why does he stand there so long at the door? And before he is gone, she bursts out laughing for she has been awake the whole time. That's about it. What a life! But I oughtn't to have brought you here. Best you have the sheet over you when the moon is about. Moonlight is bad for little daughters. I can't sleep when the moon's at the full. She keeps calling to me to get up. Perhaps I am her daughter, too. Gad, you look it tonight. Do I? Then you can paint me into the picture as well as Mama. You could call it a mother and daughter, 
or simply two ladies, if the moon thinks that calling me her daughter would make her seem too old? O oh, metre potra filia potrar. That means, O oh, moon, more beautiful than any two-penny, half-penny daughter. Daddy, do you really prefer her? Shh, she's not a patch to you. It's the sort of thing we say to our sitters to keep them in good humor. <laughs> I wish to heaven, Margaret, we were not both so fond of an apple tart. And what's this? It's a tear. I should think it's a tear. That boy at the farm did it. He kept calling snubs after me, but I got him down and kicked him in the stomach. He's a rather a jolly boy. He sounds like it. He gads. What a night. And what a moon. Dad, she is not quite so fine as that. Oh, shh. I have touched her up. <laughs> Dad. Dad, what a funny man. Hold me tight, Daddy. I, I am frightened. I think they want to take you away from me. Oh, who, Gosling? I don't know. It's too lovely, Daddy. I, I won't be able to keep hold of it. What is? The, the world. Everything. And you, Daddy, most of all. Things that are too beautiful can't last. Now, how did you find that out? I don't know, Daddy. Am I sometimes stranger than other people's daughters? Oh, more of a madcap, perhaps. <laughs> Do you think sometimes I am too full of gladness? My sweetheart, you do sometimes run over with it. <laughs> to be very gay, dearest dears, so very near to being very sad. How did you find out that, child? I don't know. From something in me that's afraid? Daddy, what is a might have been? Ah. Oh. Uh, I might have been. Hmm. They are ghosts, Margaret. I dare say I'm, I might have been. I might have been a great swell of a painter instead of just this uncommonly happy nobody. <laughs> or again, I might have been a worthless idle waster of a fellow. <laughs> you? Who knows? <laughs> Some little kink in me might have set me off on the wrong road. And that poor soul I might so easily have been might have had no Margaret. Oh, my word, I'm sorry for him. Who am I? That poor old daddy wandering the world without me. And there are other might-have-beens, lovely ones, but intangible. Shades, Margaret, made of sad folk's thoughts. I'm so glad I'm not a shade. How awful it would be, Daddy, to wake up and find out one is not alive. It would, dear. Daddy, wouldn't it be awful? I think men need daughters. They do. Especially artists. Oh, yes. Especially artists. Especially artists. Especially artists. Fame is not everything. Oh, fame is rot. Daughters are the thing. Daughters are the thing. Daughters are the thing. <laughs> I wonder if sons would be nicer. Oh, not a patch on daughters. The awful thing about a son is that never, never at least, from the day he goes to school, can you tell him that you rather like him? By the time he is 10, you can't even take him on your knee. Sons are not worth having, Margaret. Signed, W. Durth. <laughs> but if you were a mother, Dad, I dare say he would let you do it. I think so? I mean, when no one is looking. Sons are not so bad. Signed, M. Durth. But I'm glad you prefer daughters. <laughs> At what age are we nicest, Daddy? Hmm? Daddy, at what age are we nicest? Daddy, at what age are we nicest? Eh? Uh, that's a poser. <laughs> hmm, I, I think you were nicest when you were two and knew your alphabet up to G, but fell over at H. No, you were best when you were half past three. Wait, or, or just, just before you struck six. Oh no. In the mumps year, when I asked you in the early morning how you were, and you said solemnly, I haven't tried yet. Did I? Such was your answer. Uh, but I, I am not sure that chicken pox doesn't beat mumps. Oh, Lord, I'm all wrong. The nicest time in a father's life is the year before she puts up her hair. 
I suppose that is a splendid time. But there's a nicer year coming to you. Daddy, there's a nicer year coming to you. Is there, darling? Daddy, the year she does put up her hair. Puts it up forever? You know, I'm afraid that when the day for that comes, I shan't be able to stand it. It will be too exciting. My poor heart, Margaret. Oh, no, it will be lucky, you. For it isn't a bit like that. I am to be a girl and a woman day about for the first year. You will never know which I am until you look at my hair. And even then, you won't know. For if it is down, I shall put it up. And if it is up, I shall put it down. And so my daddy will gradually get used to the idea. I see you have been thinking it out. <laughs> I have been doing more than that. Shut your eyes, Dad, and I shall give you a glimpse into the future. Oh, I don't know that I want that. The present is so good. Shut your eyes, please. No, Margaret. Please, Daddy. Oh, all right. They're shut. Now don't open them till I tell you. What finger is that? Oh, the dirty one. <laughs> Daddy, now I'm going to put up my hair. I've got such a darling of a mirror. It is such a darling mirror I've got. Dad, don't look. I shall tell you all about it. It's a poor little pool of water. I wish we could take it home and hang it up. Of course, the moment my hair is up, there will be other changes also. For instance, I shall talk quite differently. Oh, Pooh, where are my matches, dear? Top pocket, waistcoat. Oh, you were meaning to frighten me just now. <laughs> no, I am just preparing you. You see, darling, I can't call you dad when my hair is up. I think I shall call you parent. Uh... Parent, dear. Do you remember the days when your Margaret was a slip of a girl and sat on your knee? How foolish we were, parent, in those distant days. Oh, shut up, Margaret. Now I must be more distant to you. More like a boy who could not sit on your knee anymore. So here, I, I want to go on painting. Shall I look now? I am not quite sure whether I want you to. It makes such a difference. Perhaps you won't know me. Even the pool is looking a little scared. What do you think? Will I do? Stand still, dear, and let me look my fill. The Margaret that is to be. You'll see me often enough, Daddy, like this, so you don't need to look your fill. You're looking as long as if we were going to be the only time. Was I? Surely it wasn't to be that. Be gay, Dad. You will be sick of Margaret with her hair up before you are done with her. Oh, I expect so. Shut up, Daddy. <laughs> Daddy, I know what you are thinking of. You are thinking, what a handful she is going to be. Well, uh, I guess she is. <laughs> and now you are thinking about, about my being in love someday. Rot. <laughs> I won't, you know. No, never. Oh, I have quite decided, so don't be afraid. Will you hate him at first, Daddy? Daddy, will you hate him? Will you hate him, Daddy? Whom? Well, if there were. If there was what, darling? You know the kind of thing I mean quite well. Would you hate him at first? I hope not. I should want to strangle him, but I wouldn't hate him. <laughs> I would. That is to say, if I liked him. If you liked him, how, how could you hate him? For daring. Daring what? You know. But of course, I shall have no say in the matter. You will do it all. You do everything for me. Oh, I can't help it. <laughs> you will even write my love letters if I have any to write, which I won't. Surely to goodness, Margaret, I will leave you alone to do that. <laughs> you. You will try to, but you won't be able. I, I want you, you see, to, to do everything exquisitely. I do wish I could leave you to do things a little more for yourself. I, I suppose it's owing to my having had to be father and mother both. I knew nothing practically about the bringing up of children. And of course, I couldn't trust you to a nurse. Not you. So sure you could do it better yourself. That's you all over. Daddy. Do you remember how you taught me to balance a biscuit on my nose like a puppy? Did I? You called me Rover. I deny that. And when you said snap, I caught the biscuit in my mouth. 
horrible. Daddy, I can still do it. Here is the last of my supper. Say snap, Daddy. Not I. <laughs> Say snap, please. I refuse. Daddy. Oh, snap. <laughs> Let that be the last time, Margaret. Except just once more. I don't mean now, but when my hair is really up. If I should ever have a, a Margaret of my own, come in and see me, Daddy, in my white bed and, and say snap, and I shall have the biscuit ready. Right, O. Dad, if I ever should marry, not that I will, but if I should, at the marriage ceremony, will you let me be the one who says I do? I suppose I deserve this. You think I'm pretty, don't you, Dad? Whatever other people say. Not so bad. I know I have nice ears. They are all right now, but I had to work on them for months. You don't mean to say that you did my ears. Rather. Well, my dimple is my own. Oh, I'm glad you think so. I wore out the point of my little finger over that dimple. Even my dimple? Have I anything that is really mine? A bit of my nose or anything? Oh, when you were a babe, you had a laugh that was all your own. Haven't I it now? It's gone. I'll tell you how it went. We were fishing in a stream. That is to say, I was wading and you were sitting on my shoulders, holding the rod. We didn't catch anything. Somehow or another, I can't think how I did it. You irritated me and I answered you sharply. I can't believe that. Yes, it sounds extraordinary, but I did. It gave you a shock, and for the moment, the world no longer seemed safe, a safe place for you. Your faith in me had always made it safe till then. You were suddenly not even sure of your bread and butter, and a frightened tear came to your eyes. I was in a nice state about it, I can tell you. Silly. But what has that to do with my laugh, Daddy? Oh, the laugh that children are born with lasts just so long as they have perfect faith. To think that it was I who robbed you of yours. Don't, dear. I am sure the laugh just went off with the tear to comfort it, and they have been playing about the stream ever since. They've quite forgotten about us, so why should we remember them, cheeky little beasts? Should I tell you my furthest back recollection? I remember the first time I saw the stars. I had never seen night, and then I saw it and the stars together. Crack in my eye, Tommy. It isn't everyone who can boast such a lovely, lovely recollection for their earliest, is it? I was determined your earliest should be a good one. Do you mean to say you planned it? Or rather, most people's earliest recollection is of some trivial thing, or how they cut their finger or, or lost a piece of string. I was resolved my Margaret's should be something bigger. I was poor, but I could give her the stars. Oh, how you love me, Daddykins. Yes, I do, rather. Good evening. Oh, good evening, Missy. Evening, mister. Lost anything? Oh, sometimes when the tourists have had their sandwiches, uh, there are bits left over, and they squeeze them between the roots uh, to keep the place tidy. I'm looking for bits. You don't tell me you are as hungry as that. Oh, try me. Daddy, that was my last biscuit. Oh, we must think of something else. Yes. Wait, we are sure to think of something. Daddy, think of something. Your father doesn't like you to touch the likes of me. Oh, yes, he does. And if he didn't, I'd do it all the same. That is a bit of myself, Daddy. Oh, that is all you know. Well, you needn't be angry with her, mister. I'm all right. I am not angry with her. I am very sorry for you. Well, if I had my rights, well, I would be as good as you and better. I dare say. I have had men servants uh, and a motor car. Margaret and I never rose to that. I have been in a taxi several times, and Dad often gets telegrams. Margaret! I'm sorry I boasted. Well, that's nothing. I have a townhouse. At least, uh, 
I had. At any rate, he said there was a townhouse. Fancy his not knowing for certain. The Honorable Mrs. Finch Fallow. That's who I am. It's a lovely name. Curse him. Don't you like him? We won't go into that. I have nothing to do with your past, but I wish we had some food to offer you. You haven't a flask. No, I don't take anything myself. But let me see. Oh, I know. You said we had five pounds. Would you like five pounds? Oh, darling, don't be stupid. We haven't paid our bill at the inn. All right. I, well, I never asked you for anything. Oh, don't take me up in that way. I have had my ups and downs myself. Here is ten bob and welcome. And I have half a crown. It is quite easy for us. Dad will be getting another fiver any day. You can't think how exciting it is when the fiver comes in. We dance and then we run out and buy chops and... Margaret! <laughs> oh, it's kind of you. I am richer this minute than I have been for many a day. Oh, it's nothing. I am sure you would do the same for us. Oh, I wish I was as sure. Oh, of course you would. But glad to be of any help. Get some victuals as quickly as you can. Best of wishes, ma'am, and, and may your luck change. Uh, same to you. And may yours go on. Good night. What is her name, mister? Margaret. Ah, Margaret. You drew something good out of the lucky bag when you got her, mister. Yes. Take care of her. They are easily lost. Poor soul. I expect she has had a rough time, and that some man is to blame for it, partly, at any rate. That woman rather affects me, Margaret. I don't know why. Didn't you like her husky voice? Ah, I say, Margaret, we lucky ones, Let's swear always to be kind to people who are down on their luck. And then, when we are kind, let's be a little kinder. Yes, let's. Margaret, always feel sorry for the failures. The ones who are always failures. Especially in my sort of calling. Oh, wouldn't it be lovely to turn them on the 39th year of failure into glittering successes? Topping. Topping. Oh, topping. How could we do it, Dad? By letter. To poor old Tom Brokenheart, top attic, Garrett Chambers, S.E. Dear Sir, His Majesty has been graciously pleased to purchase your superb picture of Marlowe Ferry. P.S. I am sending the money in a sack so as you can hear it chink. <laughs> what could we do for our friend who passed just now? Oh, I can't get her out of my head. You have made me forget her. Dad, I, I didn't like it. Didn't like what, dear? I didn't like her saying that about you losing me. Oh, I shan't lose you. It would be very hard for me if you lost me, but it would be worse for you. I don't know how I know that, but I do know it. What would you do without me? Don't talk like that, dear. It is wicked and stupid and naughty. Somehow, that poor woman. I won't paint any more tonight. Let's get out of the wood. It frightens me. Oh, and you loved it a moment ago. Oh, hello. I hadn't noticed there was a house there. Daddy, I, I feel sure there wasn't a house there. Goose, it is just that we didn't look. Our old way of letting the world go hang. <laughs> so interested in ourselves. Nice behavior for people who have been boasting about what they would do for other people. Now, I see what I ought to do. Let's get out of the wood. Oh, yes, put my idea first. It is to rouse these people and get food from them for the husky one. She is too far away now. Oh, I can overtake her. Don't go into that house, Daddy. I don't know why it is, but I'm afraid of that house. There is a kiss for each moment until I come back. <laughs> oh, naughty. Go and stand in the corner. <laughs> Who has got a nasty temper? <laughs> I shall be back before you can count a hundred. Daddy, come back. I don't want to be who might have been.
Nice job, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us again. We're going to take a short intermission before the final act of Dear Brutus. Uh, I was told last week that when I flash the lights, I may have uh, inadvertently activated some people's Amazon-based voice-activated devices. So tonight, I thought we'd try something different. Alexa, donate to the Strand Theater Company. I didn't catch that. Can okay, that the full name of the charity. Alexa, cancel. That didn't work. Cancel. Apparently, you're going to have to go to our Facebook page to donate. I'm putting a link up now. I think that these get removed from the YouTube stream very quickly. So if you would like to please head to that link quickly, uh, or you can head to our Facebook page, Pandemic Players, uh, and we keep a YouTube link up there. Uh, before we continue with the program tonight, uh, I thought that as the uh, watch awards were canceled uh, this year, they did not hold the ceremony and announce the winners today during a live stream. Uh, and as our, our group of theaters that we are supporting stretches all the way down south to Annapolis, uh, I thought it would take, uh, be good of us to take some time to congratulate um, the uh, Annapolis Summer Garden Theater uh, for their watch awards. Uh, also for those uh, won by Silhouette Stages, I believe we have uh, Stephen Foreman uh, on the feed tonight. I think I saw him in the audience who uh, won Best Director for a, uh, a musical. Uh, for his production of Cabaret. And of course, um, for our very, very good friend and uh, my fellow board member here with Pandemic Players, Emily Holmstock, uh, who won her watch award for Outstanding Lead Actress uh, in Colonial Players, Silent Sky. So congratulations to all of them. We were very glad to hear um, of, the, of the wins by our local theater companies. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Watch Awards is a Washington area theater company uh, award. Um, but some of the Baltimore, greater Baltimore area theater companies that are closer down to, uh, to 495 um, are eligible. Uh, and so we were very glad to see so many of them represented at the Watch Awards this year. Congratulations, everyone. And with that said, I think we are ready to kick off uh, Act 3, our final act here with Dear Brutus. Thank you, everyone, again for joining us. It's so good to see everyone on this Saturday evening. Um, thank you for joining us for an evening of theater and for an evening of friendship. Brutus. Lob's room has gone very dark as it sits up awaiting the possible return of the adventurers. The curtains are drawn so that no light comes from outside. There's a tapping on the window, and anon two intruders are stealing about the floor, with muffled cries when they meet unexpectedly. They find the switch and are revealed as Purdy and his Mabel. Something has happened to them as they emerged from the wood but it is so superficial that neither notices it. They are, again, in the evening dress in which they had left the house, but they are still being led by the, that strange humor of the blood. Pretty little room. I wonder who is the owner. Oh, it doesn't matter. The great thing is that we've escaped Joanna. Look, Jack, look, a man. He's asleep. Do you know him? Not I. Excuse me, sir. Hi. Extraordinary, darling. After all, precious, have we any right to wake up a stranger just to tell him that we are runaways hiding in his house? I think he would expect it of us. There is no budging him. 
<laughs> At any rate, we have done the civil thing. There have evidently been people here, but they haven't drunk their coffee. Ugh, cold as a deserted egg in a bird's nest. Jack, if you were a clever detective, you could construct those people out of their neglected coffee cups. I wonder who they are and what has spirited them away. Oh, perhaps they have only gone to bed. Ought we to knock them up? I, th I think not, dear. I suppose we have run away, Jack, meaning to? Uh, irrevocably. Uh, Mabel, if the dog like devotion of a lifetime, it... he's not shamming, do you think? Uh, shake him again. Oh. It's all right, Mabel. Uh, if the dog like devotion of a lifetime is- oh, Poor little Joanna. Still, if a woman insists on being a pendulum around a man's neck- uh, Do give me the chance, Mabel. <laughs> if the dog like devotion of a lifetime is able to- May I say this is just too much, Joanna. So, oh, sweet husband, your soul is still walking alone, is it? How can you sneak about this way, Joanna? Have you no pride? Please to address me as Mrs. Purdy, madam. Who is this man? We don't know, and there is no waking him. You can try if you'd like. You were saying something about the devotion of a lifetime. Please go on. I don't like to before you, Joanna. <laughs> don't mind me. I should certainly like to say it. And I shall be proud to hear it. Oh, I should have spared you this, Joanna, but you wouldn't put your hands over your ears. No, sir. Fie, Joanna. Surely a woman's natural delicacy. As you take in that spirit, Joanna, I, I can proceed with a clear conscience. If the dog-like devotion of a lifetime, I... Did he move? It isn't that. I'm, I'm feeling very funny. Did one of you just tap me now on the forehead? Uh, I think I've been in this room before. Uh, there's something rushing coming back to me. I seem to know that coffee set. If I do, the lid of the milk jug is chipped. I can't it remember is... this man's name, but I'm sure it begins with an L. Lob. 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 Uh, Mabel. Mabel. Your, your dress? How on earth? My dress? You were in knickerbockers in the wood. And so I am now, but where did I change? The wood, let me think, the wood, uh, the wood certainly, but the, the, the wood wasn't the wood. My head is going round. Lobs wood. I remember it all. We were here, we did go. Uh, so we did, but the, how could, where was, and who was? And what was? Don't let go. Hold on to what we were doing or we shall lose grips of ourselves. A devotion, something, something about devotion. Hold on to, hold on to devotion. If the dog liked devotion of a lifetime, which of you was I saying that to? To me. Are you sure? I'm not quite sure. Uh, Johanna, what do you think? Which of you is my wife? I am. No, I am not. It is Mabel who is your wife. Me? Why, of course you are. Mabel. <laughs> I believe I am. And yet, how can it be? I, I was running away with you. You don't need to do it now. Oh, the wood. Just hold on to the wood. The wood is what explains it. Yes, I see the whole thing. Oh, you infernal old rascal. Let us try to think it out. Don't anyone speak for a moment. Think first. Love. Hold on to love. I say, I believe I am not a deeply passionate chap at all. I, I believe I'm just a philanderer. It is what you are. Mabel, what about ourselves? But I, I didn't know, just, just a philanderer. And if people don't change, I, I suppose we shall begin all over again now. I dare say, but not with each other. I may philander again, but not with you. John, John Purdy, John Purdy, that, the fine fellow I used to think of you. <laughs> the wood has taught me one thing at any rate. What's that, Jack? Oh, that accident that shapes our lives. No, it's fate. 
but it's not fate, Joanna. Fate is something outside us. What really plays the dickens with us is something in ourselves, something that makes us go on doing the same sorts of fool things, however many chances we get. Something in ourselves? Something we're born with. Can't we cut out the beastly thing? It uh, depends, I expect, on, on how long we have pampered him. I, we can at least control him if we try hard enough, but I have for the moment an abominably clear perception of the likes of me, which never really tries. I Forgive me, Joanna, I know Mabel, uh, both of you. It isn't very pleasant to discover that one is a rotter. I suppose I shall get used to it. I could forgive anybody anything tonight. It is so lovely not to be married to you, Jack. I can understand it. I do feel small. You will soon swell up again. That is the appalling thing, but at present, at any rate, I am a rag at your feet, Joanna. No, it, it yours, Mabel. Are you going to pick me up? I don't advise it. I don't know whether I want to, Jack. To begin with, which of us is your lonely soul in search of? Which of us is the fluid one or the fluido one? Are you and I one, or are you and Joanna one? Or are the three of us two? He wants you to whisper in his ear, Mabel, the entrancing poem, Mabel Purdy. Do it, Jack, there will be nothing wrong in it now. Rub it in. When I meet Joanna's successor. No, 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 Mabel, none of that. At least credit me with having my eyes open at last. There will be no more of this. I swear by all that is true. Bah, well. he is off again. Oh, Lord, so I am. <laughs> Don't, Joanna. She is quite right. I was. In my present state of depression, which won't last, I feel there is something in me that will make me go on being the same ass, however many chances I get. I haven't the stuff in me to take warning. My whole being is corroded. Uh, Shakespeare knew what he was talking about. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are underlings. For dear Brutus, we are to read dear audience, I suppose. You have it. Meaning that we have the power to shape ourselves? We have the power right enough. But isn't that rather splendid? Uh, for those who have the grit in them, yes. And they are not the dismal chappies. They are the ones with the thin, bright faces. I am afraid there is not much fight in me, Mabel, but we shall see. If you catch me at it again, have the goodness to whisper to me in passing, lobs would. That might cure me for the time being. Perhaps I will. As long as I care to bother Jack, it depends on how long that is to be. I feel that there is hope in that as well as a warning. Perhaps the wood may prove to have been useful after all. You know, we are not people worth being sorrowful about, so let us laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have forgotten the others. I wonder what is happening to them. Yes, what about them? Have they changed? <laughs> I don't see any of them in the wood. Perhaps we did see them without knowing them. We didn't know Lob. That's true. Won't it be delicious to be here to watch them when they come back and see them waking up or, or whatever it was we did? But what was it we did? I think something tapped me on the forehead. <laughs> how do we know the others will come back? We don't know. Oh, how awful. Listen. Uh, I distinctly hear someone on the stairs. It will be Beatty. Be cautious, both of you. Don't tell him we have had any uh, odd experiences. Mrs. Code, we've come back at last. Where is Mr. Code? Did he go into the wood too? We can't quite hear you, Mrs. Code. Could you speak a little louder? <laughs> Have you seen Cody? I've been down several times to look for him. Oh, I wonder if, oh, how dreadful. Oh, what is dreadful, Joanna? Nothing. 
I, I was just wondering what he's doing. Doing? Why should he be doing? Did anything odd happen to you in the woods? Uh, no, no, nothing. <laughs> we just strolled about and came back. <sighs> Have you noticed him? Oh, yes. He's been like this all the time. A sort of stupor, I think, and sometimes the strangest grin comes over his face. Oh, a grin? Oh, just like he is seeing amusing things in his sleep. Uh, I dare say he is. Oughtn't we get to Mady to him? Well, Mady's gone too. What? At all events, he's not in the house. Matey? I wonder who is with him. Ooh, must somebody be with him? Oh, uh, no, not at all. Oh, I hope that is Cody. I hope it is not. Well, why, Mrs. Purdy? Oh, dear Mrs. Code, whoever he is and whatever he does, I beg you not to be surprised. We feel that... Though we had no unusual experiences in the wood, others may not have been so fortunate. Uh, and be cautious, you dear, what you say to them before they come to. Come to? You puzzle me. And Cody didn't have his muffler. Oh, it is, matey. <laughs> Do come in. Uh, with apologies, ladies and gents. May I ask who is host? Oh, a very reasonable request. A third on the left. <laughs> uh, merely to ask, sir, if you can direct me to my hotel. The gentleman seems to be uh, reposing. It is Lob. What is Lob, ma'am? Surely you haven't forgotten. Uh, anything we can do for you, sir. Just give it a name. <laughs> I hope you are not alone. Do say you have some lady friends with you. Uh, my wife is with me. His wife? You have been quick. Oh, I didn't know you were married. Why should you, madam? You talk as if you knew me. Good gracious. Do you really think I don't? Um, sit down, won't you, my dear sir, and, and make yourself comfortable. Uh, thank you, but my wife... Yes, bring her in. We are simply dying to make her acquaintance. <sighs> You are very good. I am much obliged. Who do you think she could be? Who? 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 <laughs> but what an extraordinary wood. He doesn't seem whom to know who he is at all. Don't worry about that, Cody darling. He will know soon enough. And so will the little wife. By the way, whoever she is, I hope she is fond of butlers. <sighs> it's Lady Caroline. Oh, joy, joy. And she was so sure she couldn't take the wrong turning. <laughs> May I present my wife, Lady Caroline Matey. How do you do? Your servant, Lady Caroline. <laughs> Lady Caroline Matey? You? Charmed, I'm sure. Very pleased to meet any wife of Mr. Matey. Uh, allow me. The, the Duchess of Candelabra, the ladies Helena and Matilda Minab. I am the Lord Chancellor. <laughs> I have wanted so long to make your acquaintance. Charmed. These informal meetings are so delightful, don't you think? Yes, indeed. And your friend by the fire? Uh, I will introduce you to him when he wakes up. I, I mean, when you wake up, uh, when he wakes up. <laughs> Perhaps I ought to have said that I am James Matey. The James Matey. A name not perhaps unknown in the world of finance. Finance? Oh, so you did take that clerkship in the city. I began as a clerk in the city, certainly, and I am not ashamed to admit it. And see that now. And did it save you? Save me, madam? I excuse us. We ask odd questions in this house. We only mean, did that keep you honest? Or are you still a pilferer? Husband mine, what does she mean? No offense, I mean a uh, pilferer on a large scale. If you are referring to that Labrador business or the working woman's bank. Got him. <laughs> yes, those are what I meant. There was nothing proved. Mabel, Jack, here is another of us. You have gone just the same way again, my friend. There is more in it, you see, than taking the wrong turning. You would always take the wrong turning. Tra-la-la! -la. If you are casting any aspersions on my husband, 
Allow to me to say that a prouder wife than I does not today exist. Oh, my dear, please be careful. So long as you are satisfied, dear Lady Caroline. But I thought you shrank from all blood that was not blue. You thought? Why should you think about me? I beg to assure you that I adore my Jim. What, whatever are you doing, Jim? I don't understand it, Caroline, but somehow I feel at home with this in my hand. <laughs> Caroline! <laughs> Look at me well. Don't you remember me? I don't remember you, but I seem to associate you with hard-boiled eggs. <laughs> you like your eggs hard-boiled. Hold on to hard-boiled eggs. Oh, she used to tip you especially to see them. Yes, that was the pocket. <laughs> tip? Tip. <laughs> Jolly word, isn't it? <laughs> it seems to set me thinking. Why is my work basket in this house? Well, you are living here, you know. Well, yes, that is what a person feels. But when did I come? It's very odd, but one feels one ought to say when one did go. He is coming too with a whoosh. Mr. Purdy. Mrs. Code. The governor, my clothes. One is in an evening dress. You will understand clearly in a minute, Caroline. You didn't really take that clerkship, Jim. You went into domestic service, but in the essentials, you haven't altered. I'll have my shaving water at 7.30 sharp, matey. Very good, sir. Sir, Midsummer's Eve, the wood. Yes, hold on to the wood. You are, you are. You are Lady Caroline Laney. And you, you are Matey, the butler. You seemed quite happy with him, you know, Lady Caroline. We won't tell. Caroline Matey, and I seem to like it. Oh, how horrible. It is rather difficult to see what we should do next. Perhaps if I were to go downstairs. Oh, it would be conferring a personal favor on us all. It's all that wretch is doing. <laughs> Cody. Oh, Cody. Why is he so happy? Oh, dear, hold my hand. Won't he know me? Mrs. Code, I'm sorry. It didn't so much matter about the likes of us, but for your sake, I wish Cody hadn't gone out. We that have been happily married 30 years. Um, may I intrude? Um, my name is Cody. Uh, the fact is I was playing about in the wood on a whistle and I saw your light. Playing about in the wood with a whistle? Then why not, madam? Madam, don't you know me? Oh, I, I don't know you, uh, but I wish I did. Do you? Why? Well, if I may say so, you, you have a very soft, lovable face. Who was with you playing whistles in the wood? No one was with me. No lady? Uh, certainly not. I am a bachelor. <laughs> a bachelor? Oh, don't give way, dear. It might be much worse. A bachelor? And you are sure you've never spoken to me before? Do you think? Hmm. Not uh, to my knowledge. Uh, never uh, accepted dreams. What did you say to her in your dreams? I, I said, my dear, odd. The darling man. How could you say such things to an old, old woman? Oh. Old? Uh, well, I, I didn't think of you as old. No, no young. Uh, with the morning dew on your face, coming across a lawn in a black and green dress and, uh, and carrying such a pretty parasol. That was how he first met me. He used to love me in black and green, and it was a pretty parasol. Oh, look, 
I'm so old. I can't be the same woman. Old? Oh, yes, I suppose so, but but it is the same soft, lovable face and, and the same kind, beaming smile that the children could warm their hands at. Oh, he always liked my smile. So do we all. Emma. <gasps> he hasn't forgotten my name. Is it sad that we didn't meet long ago? I think I have been waiting for you. I, I suppose we have met too late. You couldn't overlook my being an old fellow, could you, eh? Oh, how lovely. He's going to propose to her again. Cody, you happy thing, he is wanting the same soft face after 30 years. Oh, we mustn't be too sure, but I think that is it. What exactly is it that you want, Mr. Code? I, I want to have the right to hold the parasol over you. Won't you be my wife, my dear? And so give my long dream of you a happy ending. Kisses are not called for at our age, Cody, but here is a muffler for your old neck. Oh, my muffler, I, I must have missed it. Uh, what, 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 what is this? Well, he is coming too. Bob. Oh, bless me, Cody, I went into that wood. And without your muffler, you that are so subject to chills. What are you feeling for in your pocket? The, 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 the whistle. It, it is a whistle. I, oh, gone. Uh, of course it is. It, it's, it's rather a pity, but uh, oh, have I been saying awful things to you? You have been making her so proud. It is a compliment to our whole sex. You had a second chance, and it is her again. Oh, well, of course it is. Oh, but I see I was the same nice old lazy Cody as before. And I, I thought if I had a second chance, I, I could do things. I've often said to you, Cody, that it was owing to my being cursed with a competency that I didn't write my great book. But I had no competency this time and I haven't written a word. That may make you feel lonely in this house. You seem to have been very happy as an old bachelor, dear. Uh, I am surprised about myself, Emma, but I, I, I fear I was. I wonder if that means that you just don't especially need me. I wonder if it means that you're just the sort of amiable creature that would be happy anywhere and anyhow. Oh dear, okay, can it be as bad as that? Certainly not. It is a romance, and I won't have it looked upon as anything else. Thank you, Joanna. You will try not to miss the whistle, Cody? Oh, you are all I need. Yes, but I am not so sure as I used to be that that is a great compliment. Cody, behave. Oh, Mrs. Death. She is alone. Who would have expected that of her? <laughs> she is a wild one, Jack. But I sometimes thought rather a dear. I do hope she has got off cheaply. Pleased to see you, stranger. Oh, I was afraid such an unceremonious entry might startle you. Oh, not a bit. I usually enter a house by the front door. I've heard there is such is the swagger way. <laughs> oh, so stupid of me. I lost myself in the wood and... Of course you did, but but never mind that. Do tell us your name. Yes, yes, your name. Well, of course. I am the Honorable Mrs. Finch Fallow. Oh, of course, of course. I hope Mr. Finch Fallow is very well. We don't know him personally, but may we have the pleasure of seeing him bob up presently? No, I I'm not sure where he is. I wonder if the dear, clever police know. Oh, no, no, they don't. <clears throat> uh, so awkward. <laughs> I 
gave my sandwiches to a poor girl and her father, whom I met in the wood. And now, well, isn't it a nuisance? I'm quite hungry. Oh. May I? Poor soul. We are so anxious to know whether you met a friend of ours in the wood, a Mr. Durth. Perhaps you know him too. Durth? Well, I don't know any Durth. Oh dear, what a wood! He is quite a front door sort of man. Knocks and rings, you know. Don't worry her. I meet so many. You see, I, I, I go out a great deal. I have visiting cards, uh, printed ones. <laughs> How very distinguished. Perhaps Mr. Durth has painted your portrait. He is an artist. Oh, very likely. <laughs> they all want to paint me. I dare say it is that is the man to whom I gave my sandwiches. But I thought you said he had a daughter. Oh, such a pretty girl. I gave her half a crown. A daughter? That can't be Durth. Uh, don't be too sure. Uh, was the man you speak a, a, a rather chop-fallen, gone-to-the-seed sort of person? Uh, no, I thought him uh, such a jolly and attractive man. Durth? Jolly? Attractive? Oh, oh no. Did, did he say anything about his wife? Yes. Do try to remember if he mentioned her. No, he didn't. Well, he was far from jolly in her time. Hmm. Well, perhaps that was the lady's fault. Uh, there's voice. He, he sounds quite merry. Oh, Alice, you poor thing. Uh, this is going to be horrible. <laughs> I am sorry to bounce in on you this way, but really I have an excuse. I am a painter of sorts, and... Uh, I must say, Mr. Durth, I am delighted to see you looking so well. Like a new man, isn't he? I am certainly very well, if you care to know. But did I tell you my name? No, but uh, but we have an instinct in this house. Well, it doesn't matter. Here is the situation. My daughter and I have just met in the wood a poor woman famishing for want of food. We were as happy as Griggs ourselves, and the sight of her distress rather cut us up. Can you give me something for her? Why, why are you all looking so startled? Ah, may I have this? I feel I can't be mistaken. It was you I met in the wood. Have you been playing some trick on me? It was for her I wanted the food. Well, have you come to take back the money you gave me? Your dress. You were almost in rags when I saw you outside. Well, I don't understand. Uh, for that matter, Durth, I, I dare say you were different in the wood, too. What? But where am I? Well, I seem to know you. Do I? Oh, yes, you do. Hold my hand and you will soon remember all about it. I am afraid, Mr. Durth, it is harder for you than for the rest of us. I, I wish I could help you, but I can't. I'm a rotter. We are awfully sorry. Don't you remember? Midsummer Eve? Midsummer Eve? This room. Yes, this room. You was... was it you? We're... we're going out to look for something. The Tree of Knowledge, wasn't it? Somebody wanted me to go to. Who was that? A lady, I think. Why did she ask me to go? What was I doing here? Ah, I was smoking a cigar. I laid it down there. Who was the lady? Think about a second chance. Yes, you poor dear. You thought you could make so much of it. Ah, a lady who didn't like me. She had good reasons to, but... What were they? A little old man. He did it. What did he do? I am. It is coming back. I am not the man I thought myself. I am not Mrs. Finchfallow. 
Who am I? You were that lady. It is you, my husband. Oh, my dear, you are so much better off, so far as I can see, than if you were Mrs. Finchfallow. Yes. Yes, indeed. But he isn't. Alice! I... I didn't know you when I was in the wood with Margaret. She... she... Margaret. Oh, my God! Oh, I wish. I wish. Oh, Lob, you old ruffian. No, I am rather fond of him. Our lonely, friendly little host. Lob, I thank thee for that hour. Did you see that his hand is shaking again? Yeah, the watery eye has come back. And yet they are both quite nice people. Oh, we are all quite nice people. If she were not such a savage. I dare say there was nothing the matter with her, except that she would always choose the wrong man, good man or bad man, but the wrong man for her. <laughs> uh, we can't change. Jack says the brave ones can. The ones with the thin, bright faces. Then there is hope for you and me, Jack. I don't expect so. Hadn't we better go to bed? It must be getting late. Hold on to bed. Breakfast is quite ready. Nice. My watch has stopped, and mine. There Just is a well, perhaps. There's a smell of coffee. Come along, Cody. I I do hope you have not been tiring your foot. I shall give it a good rest tomorrow, dear. I have given your egg six minutes, ma'am. A strange experiment, matey. Does it ever have any permanent effect? So far as I know, not often, miss, but I believe once in a while. You can ask him. Bob kicks responsively, meaning perhaps that none of the others will change till there is a tap from another hammer. But when Matey goes to rout him from his chair, he is no longer there. His disappearance is no shock to Matey who shrugs his shoulders and opens the windows to let in the glory of a summer morning. The garden has returned, and our queer little hero is among his flowers. A lark is rising. Thank you everyone once again for joining us for Dear Brutus. This was a play that was completely new to so many of us at the beginning of this week. Uh, something that we all absolutely fell in love with. Uh, I hope that if it was new to you, you found something really magical in it. Um, if you could, we ask you one more time to help our good friends at the Strand Theater Company. 
Um, I'm noticing that it seems that our, our links to our Facebook page um, are not exactly going out over the, um, the YouTube comments. So in the description for tonight's broadcast, you'll see a donation page uh, on Facebook that's listed in the descriptor. Uh, if you can go there, you can help our good friends at The Strand. Um, and thank you once again for, uh, for taking part in this. Uh, we know that there is no theater without an audience, and we are so very, very grateful for each and every one of you. Uh, we hope that you stay safe. We hope that you join us next week uh, for Midsummer Night's Dreams by William Shakespeare. Uh, and thank you. Thank you once again. If you are looking for us, please uh, reach out to us uh, at Pandemic Players, or if you're looking to volunteer uh, at the Pandemic Players Planning Group on Facebook. Um, other than that, that's that's all we have for you tonight. We look forward to seeing you next week. Pandemic players out. <laughs>